subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates hello everybody welcome to daily news simplified in answer to what why and how of news variety today we shall be analyzing the hindu newspaper dated 1st of april 2021 of the new delhi edition the topics to be discussed today have been presented on the screen time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below let us begin our today's discussion in our weekly series of mains assignment questions from the daily news simplified videos this week's mains assignment question is with respect to the ipr regime in india the question here is highlight the major concerns and issues raised by the developed countries with respect to the intellectual property rights regime of india this question has been asked for 15 marks and you are required to write the answer in 250 words now before writing the answer to this particular question i suggest you to go through the dns dated 4th of jan 2021 in which we have covered in much greater detail about various concerns and issues which have been raised by the developed countries with respect to the intellectual property regime in india those of you who would be able to submit the answers by the end of saturday your answers would get evaluated by the teachers and faculties of rouse is all the best the first article appears on page number 8 in the form of a lead article the article is titled as still no recognition of the third tier this article shall be important both from the perspective of prelims as well as mains under the subsection of polity and governance see article 280 of the indian constitution provides for the setting up of the union finance commission by the president every 5 years or earlier usually the recommendations of the finance commissions are applicable for a period of 5 years but this time the recommendations of the 15th finance commission would be applicable for a period of 6 years in the year 2019-20 the 15th finance commission submitted its first report and the recommendations were valid for the duration 2020 2021 recently before the presentation of the union budget the 15th finance commission has submitted its second set of recommendations the second set of recommendations would be applicable for the next 5 years from 2021 to 2026 in this regard this particular lead article here provides a critique of the 15th finance commission recommendations particularly with respect to the transfer of grants to the local bodies that is transfer of grants to the panchayati raj institutions and municipalities now this particular article related to the 15th finance commission is extremely important both from the perspective of mains as well as prelims because as you can see in previous year mains 2018 there was a question related to the finance commission similarly in previous year prelims 2016 as well as 2015 there were questions related to the union finance commission as well as the state finance commission even though the scope of this particular article is quite limited to the critique of the 15th finance commission recommendations with respect to transfer of grants to the local bodies we will not confine ourselves only to this particular aspect rather we will take this as an opportunity to go into the detail aspects of the recommendations of the 15th finance commission which have been submitted in its second set of report now based upon our discussion we could get different questions both in the prelims as well as in the mains for example a two main space question for practice from this particular video discussion could be critically examine the recommendations of the 15th finance commission with respect to the transfer of grants to local bodies in india so since the keyword here is critically examine you should know both pros as well as cons with respect to the 15th finance commission recommendations with respect to transfer of grants to local bodies the second mains question for practice here is the 15th finance commission has done a fine balancing act between the need to consider the population of 2011 census and the concerns raised by the southern states with respect to the devolution of taxes elaborate so depending upon the requirement of the upsc prelims as well as the mains examination we will go into the detail aspects of the second report submitted by the 15th finance commission 
Now, before understanding the various facets of the Union Finance Commission, let us first understand as to why do we need the Union Finance Commission in a federal polity such as India. So, the federal polity that India has adopted provides for the distribution of legislative, executive and financial powers between the centre and the states. In particular, the seventh schedule of the Indian constitution provides for three lists that is the union list, state list and the concurrent list. So we have 100 subjects under the union list, 61 subjects under the state list and 52 subjects under the concurrent list. Now with respect to the distribution of legislative powers, the parliament alone can make laws on the subjects placed under the union list. The state legislature alone can make laws on the subjects placed under the state list. However, for the subjects placed under the concurrent list, both the parliament as well as the state legislature can make the laws. However, in case of conflict between the union law and the state law, the law made by the parliament shall prevail upon the law made by the state legislature. This is as far as the distribution of legislative powers is concerned. With respect to the distribution of executive powers, the central government has the power to implement the laws related to the union list. The state government has the power to implement the laws on the subjects placed under the state list. As far as the concurrent list is concerned, see, with respect to implementation of laws on the subjects placed under the concurrent list, we cannot have both the central government and the state government implementing the same laws because this can lead to the problem of coordination. Now, for example, education and forest are the subjects which have been placed under the concurrent list, which means both the parliament as well as the state legislature can make laws related to the promotion of education and the protection of forest. But we cannot have both the centre as well as states implementing these laws. We need to have a single authority to implement the laws on the subjects placed under the state list. Now, in case of India, it is the responsibility of the state governments to implement the laws on the subjects placed under the state list. This is as far as the executive powers are concerned. Now, if you look at the distribution of the taxation powers or the finances, the center has relatively higher finances in comparison to the states. This is so because the most important taxes in case of India, such as the corporate tax, income tax, customs duty, etc. These taxes have been vested under the control of the central government. Whereas the less important taxes, such as the property tax, professional tax, excise duty on liquor, etc. have been vested under the control of the state government. So the amount of revenue that the state government earns that is compared to lower as compared to the revenue earned by the states. So if you look at the overall responsibilities of the center and the states, it is being said that states have comparatively higher responsibilities in comparison to the center. This is on account of mainly two factors. First and foremost, if you look at the responsibilities of the state government, the state governments are required to implement the laws on the subjects which are placed under both state list as well as concurrent list. Whereas the center would be required to implement the laws only on the subjects placed under the union list. So this is the one reason as to why the responsibilities of the states are more than the center. Second reason being, if you look at the most important subjects which are to do with the inclusive growth and development, for example, agriculture, health, public order, etc. All these subjects have been vested under the control of the state government. So the state governments are required to spend more amount of money in order to promote inclusive growth and development in a federal setup such as India. That is why the states have comparatively higher responsibilities in comparison to the center. So this creates a kind of fiscal imbalance. Fiscal imbalance because the center has relatively higher finances but relatively lower responsibilities while the states have relatively higher responsibilities but relatively lower finances. That is why 
we need to provide for a mechanism to transfer the finances from the center to the states. Now, this transfer of finances from the center to the states basically takes place through the finance commission and through the centrally sponsored schemes. Earlier, this also used to take place through the planning commission. But I hope you must be aware planning commission has been done away with and the planning commission has been replaced by Niti Aayog. And Niti Aayog right now does not have the power to transfer the finances to the states. So right now, this fiscal imbalance in the federal polity is addressed through the finance commission transfers and the centrally sponsored schemes. So finance commission, as I stated before, it is a constitutional body set up under Article 280 of the Indian Constitution. It is required to be set up by the president every five years or earlier. The Indian Constitution has not given elaborate provisions related to the composition of the Finance Commission. The composition of the Finance Commission has been provided under the Finance Commission Act 1951. Under this particular act, the chairperson of the Finance Commission needs to be a person who is an expert in the field of public affairs. Apart from the chairman, we need to have four other members who are expert in the field of economics. Second member should be an expert in the field of financial matters and administration. Third member should be an expert in the field of finance and accounts. And the fourth member should either be a former judge of high court or he should be a person who should be qualified to become a judge of the high court. So this is a composition of the finance commission. As far as the 15th Finance Commission is concerned, the 15th Finance Commission is headed by Mr. N.K. Singh. The recommendation of the Finance Commission is to provide for the vertical distribution of taxes between the center and the states, horizontal distribution of taxes among the states, provide for the grants in aid to the states, and lastly, after the implementation of 73rd and 74th Amendment Act, a new mandate has been added to the Finance Commission. The mandate here is the Finance Commission is required to recommend measures in order to augment the resources of the panchayats and municipalities. And this recommendation is given by the Union Finance Commission based upon the recommendation submitted by the State Finance Commission. Let us now look at the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission. First and foremost, we do have the concept of the divisible pool of central taxes. So all the taxes collected by the center, such as the corporate tax, income tax, customs duty, etc. All of these taxes become part of the central divisible pool of taxes. However, please do note that surcharge and cess, which are imposed and collected by the center, they are not part of the central divisible pool of taxes. So while all the union taxes, such as the corporate tax, income tax, etc., are required to be distributed between the center and the states, the surcharge and cess continue to remain only with the center. Now, the first set of the recommendations of the Finance Commission is with respect to the vertical distribution of taxes. That is, the Finance Commission recommends as to what percent of the central divisible pool of taxes should remain with the center and what percent should be transferred to the states. So, as you can see, in its first report, the 15th Finance Commission had recommended that the center should transfer 41% of the central divisible pool of taxes to the states. In its second report, the 15th Finance Commission has decided to continue with the same share of the state taxes at 41%. So as you can see, the 14th Finance Commission had recommended for a transfer of 42%, but the 15th Finance Commission has reduced the share of the state taxes by 1%. This is mainly on the account of fact that the erstwhile state of JNK has now been turned into a union territory because of which the overall share of the state taxes has got reduced by 1%. So once the vertical distribution of taxes is decided, the second set of recommendations is with respect to the horizontal distribution of taxes. Now the horizontal distribution of taxes basically tells us as to how this 41% of the state taxes has to be distributed among the different states in India. See, the different states in India have different requirements. Their population is different, their area is different, their development needs are different. So, by taking into account these parameters, 
different states should get different share of the state taxes accordingly the finance commission usually adopt the criteria for the horizontal distribution so as you can see the 14th finance commission had adopted the criteria of population of 1971 census population of 2011 census area of a state forest cover income distance criteria so among all of these criteria the highest criteria was given to the income distance now under this income distance the finance commission looks at the per capita income of a particular state and compares this with the per capita income of the richest state in india that is whichever state has the highest per capita income with that particular state the per capita income of a particular state is compared so if the difference between the per capita income of a particular state and the per capita income of a richer state is higher this means that this particular state is quite poorer because of which this particular state would get higher share of the finances on the other hand let's say the difference between the per capita income of a particular state with the per capita income of a richer state is quite lower it means that a particular state is quite richer because of which such a state would get less share of the central taxes so this particular criteria of income distance has been adopted in order to promote balanced regional development among the states in india now as far as the 15 finance commission is concerned whatever criteria of the 15 finance commission had adopted in its first report it has decided to continue the same criteria even in its second report as well so as you can see it has completely done away with the population of 1971 census it has given a higher weightage to the population of 2011 census it has introduced the criteria of forest and ecology wherein it is looking at the share of dense forest in a particular state it has also introduced the criteria of tax efforts which is basically looking at the tax to gdp ratio of a particular state so whichever state has taken adequate number of measures to increase its tax to gdp ratio such a state would get higher share of the central taxes now one of the most important parameter which has been introduced by the 15 finance commission is with respect to the demographic performance see when the 15 finance commission was initially appointed the center had recommended or rather asked the 15 finance commission to explore the possibility of completely doing away with the population of 1971 census and use only the population of 2011 census as a criteria but if the 15 finance commission had completely adopted the population of only the 2011 census and done away with the census of 1971 then this would have gone against the interest of the southern states now if you look at the southern states in india particularly the states such as kerala tamil nadu etc these states have taken adequate amount of measures as part of the family planning because of which they have been able to reduce their overall population growth rate the fertility rate in these states is quite lower in comparison to the northern states so if you take into account only the population of 2011 census then this would go against the interests of the southern states so amount of the central transfer to the southern states would be lower in comparison to the northern states if we adopt only the population of 2011 census so the southern states felt that they are wrongly penalized for reducing their population growth rate while the northern states are being incentivized to increase their overall population hence in order to take into account the concerns raised by the southern states the 15 finance commission has introduced a criteria of demographic performance now under this particular criteria the 15 finance commission is looking at the overall fertility rate in a particular state fertility rate as you know basically denotes as to how many children a woman gives birth to during her reproductive age so if the fertility rate in a particular state is lower it means that such a state had taken adequate amount of measures as part of family planning programs and has reduced its population growth rate accordingly such a state would be given a higher share of the central taxes on the other hand if the fertility rate in a particular state is even today higher then such a state would get less share of the central taxes
So this particular criteria of demography performance has been introduced by the 15th Finance Commission to take into account the concerns raised by the southern states. Now, apart from the horizontal distribution of taxes, the Finance Commission also provides recommendations with respect to the grants for various aspects. For example, one of the most important grants recommended by the Finance Commission is the Revenue Deficit Grants. In order to recommend for the Revenue Deficit Grants, the Finance Commission looks at the Revenue Deficit of a particular state and then recommends grants in such a way that the revenue deficit of a particular state becomes equal to zero. Now, for example, let's say for the state of Karnataka, the revenue expenditure is rupees 150, whereas the revenue receipts is equal to 100. So, in this particular case, the Karnataka government is facing a revenue deficit of rupees 50. Now, the Finance Commission may give a recommendations to transfer a revenue deficit grant of rupees 50 to the government of Karnataka so that its revenue deficit becomes equal to zero. Now, this particular approach followed by the Finance Commission is referred to as the gap filling approach. The other set of grants recommended by the Finance Commission are with respect to the grants to the local bodies about which we will be discussing later, sector specific grants to various important sectors such as education, health, drinking water, sanitation, etc and grants for the disaster risk management about which we will be discussing next. See the Disaster Management Act 2005 provides for the setting up of the National Disaster Response Fund at the center and the State Disaster Response Fund at the state level. The Finance Commission usually recommends as to what should be the corpus of NDRF and SDRF. So once the Finance Commission recommends as to how much money should be there in NDRF and SDRF, the center would then mobilize the money. The money for NDRF is mobilized by the center mainly through two routes. One, from the allocation from the budget and second one, through the imposition of the National Calamity Contingency Duty. The National Calamity Contingency Duty is a form of surcharge on customs duty as well as excise duty on certain important products such as alcohol, cigarettes, petroleum products, etc. So whenever any entity is paying the excise duty or the customs duty on these products, on top of these duties, they would be required to pay the surcharge and all that surcharge would go into the National Calamity Contingency Duty, which then is used for the National Disaster Response Fund. As far as the funding for the SDRF is concerned, the funding is provided both by the center as well as the states. As you can see for the general states, the center provides 75% of the funding and the remaining 25% of the funding is provided by the respective state governments. In case of the northeastern and Himalayan states, the funding pattern happens to be 90 is to 10. Now presently, the NDRF and SDRF funds can be used only for providing rescue and relief operations. They cannot be used for mitigating the impact of disasters. Now, for example, if a particular state is affected by floods, then the money under NDRF and SDRF can be used only to provide rescue and relief operations. They cannot be used for creating the flood embankments, that is, to mitigate the impact of floods. Now, the Disaster Management Act 2005 provides for the setting up of the mitigation funds both at the center as well as the state level. Unfortunately, these mitigation funds have not been established. Accordingly, the 15 Finance Commission has recommended that both the center as well as states have to set up the mitigation funds at their respective level. And once they are established, they would have to merge into their respective disaster response funds. Now, for example, at the center, NDRF and NDMF should get merged into a new fund known as the National Disaster Risk and Mitigation Fund. Similarly, at the state level, they should get merged into State Disaster Risk and Mitigation Fund. As you can see, the corpus of this particular fund can be used both for rescue and relief operations as well as to mitigate the impact of disasters. For example, they can use 80% of the funds to provide rescue and relief operations and remaining 20% of the funds can be used for 
mitigating the impact of disaster. So this particular recommendation of the 15th Finance Commission has already been accepted by the union government and hence this is going to give a big fillip to the mitigation of the disasters in India. Accordingly, this becomes quite important for your upcoming prelims examination. The next recommendation of the 15th Finance Commission is with respect to defense modernization. See, presently a major chunk of the defense expenditure is majorly spent for the revenue expenditure, that is, for the payment of salaries and pensions of the defense personnel. Less amount of money is spent for the capital expenditure, that is, for acquiring new weapons and ammunition. Accordingly, in order to undertake defense modernization, the 15th Finance Commission has recommended to create a separate and dedicated fund known as Modernization Fund for Defense and Internal Security. This fund should be a non-lapsable fund under the public account of India. The money for this particular fund can be mobilized from basically three different sources. First one is from the Consolidated Fund of India. Second one is to the disinvestment of the defense PSUs. And third one is through the monetization of the surplus defense land. Coming to the last set of recommendations related to the transfer to the local bodies. See, just like how you have the Union Finance Commission at the central level, we do have the State Finance Commission at the state level. The Union Finance Commission basically decides as to what percentage of the taxes collected by the center should remain with the center and what percentage should be transferred to the states. The role of the State Finance Commission is almost similar. The State Finance Commission basically decides as to what percentage of the taxes collected by the respective state government should remain with the state government and what percentage should be transferred to the local bodies, that is, to the Panchayatiraj institutions and the municipalities in a particular state. The Union Finance Commission is set up under Article 280, whereas the State Finance Commission for the Panchayati Raj institutions is set up under Article 243i and for the urban local bodies, it is set up under Article 243y. The Union Finance Commission is set up by the President, whereas the State Finance Commission is set up by the Governor. The Union Finance Commission can be set up every five years or earlier, whereas the State Finance Commission has to be set up every five years. So the word or earlier is not mentioned for the creation of the State Finance Commission. Now with respect to the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission on the grants to the local bodies. So usually the Finance Commission do not recommend for the grants to local bodies in terms of percent of the divisible pool. Rather, they recommend for the grants to local bodies in terms of absolute amount. So when the 15th Finance Commission submitted its first report, it had recommended for the transfer of 90,000 crores for the year 2021. And now in its second report, which will be applicable for the period 2021 to 2026, it has recommended for the transfer of 4.36 lakh crores. So as stated before, the Finance Commissions usually recommends for grants to local bodies in terms of absolute amount. But if you convert this in terms of divisible pool of central taxes, this would be approximately 4.23%. Now this particular article, that is the lead article that we are discussing, has highlighted that the overall transfer of grants to local bodies has increased over a period of time. Secondly, see once the finance commission decides as to how much of grants should be given to the local bodies, these grants to local bodies in turn have to be distributed among different states. So just like how we have the criteria for the horizontal distribution of taxes between the states, the Finance Commission also adopts a criteria for the distribution of these grants to local bodies. The 15th Finance Commission has basically used two criteria for the distribution of grants to local bodies in different states. This is based upon the population of 2011 census and the area of a state. So whichever state has higher population, whichever state has a higher area, the local bodies in such states would get higher grants from the central government. Thirdly, the grants for local bodies have to be distributed between the Panchayati Raj institutions and the urban local bodies. Now, 
In its second report, the 15th Finance Commission has recommended that 65% of the grants have to be given to the Panchayati Raj institutions and remaining 35% of the grants have to be distributed among the urban local bodies. The grants which are recommended by the Finance Commission, they can be of two types, that is the tied grants and untied grants. Tied grant basically means that the Finance Commission will lay down the purposes for which the funds can be utilized for. Untied grants means the local bodies would have complete operational and financial autonomy to decide as to for what purpose the funds can be utilized for. Now the 15th Finance Commission has recommended that 60% of the funds should be tied funds. So the 15th Finance Commission has recommended that 60% of the funds should be used for various national priorities such as water, education, health, sanitation, etc. Whereas remaining 40% of the funds can be used by Panchayati Raj institutions and urban local bodies according to their local priorities. Apart from that, the 15th Finance Commission has also laid down certain conditionalities on the PRIs and urban local bodies in order to avail these grants. They are basically required to fulfill two conditionalities. First and foremost, for the previous year, the PRIs and urban local bodies, they would be required to submit their annual accounts in an online mode. And for the year before, they would have to get their accounts audited. So only when they are able to fulfill these two conditionalities, they would be able to avail the grants. Now with respect to these recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission on the grants to the local bodies, this article has raised certain concerns. The first concern is with respect to the criteria for the horizontal distribution of grants. Now, as stated before, the 15th Finance Commission has decided to distribute the grants to local bodies to different states based upon the criteria of population and the area of a state. Prior to the 15th Finance Commission, the 13th Finance Commission had also used the criteria of income distance. So, as stated before, under the income distance, whichever state is poor, such a state would get higher share of the taxes. But the 15th Finance Commission has done away with the criteria of income distance and it has used only the criteria of population and the area of a state. Because of which, the local bodies in poorer states may not get adequate amount of resources. Apart from that, the 15th Finance Commission had also used the criteria of share of SC and ST population in a particular state which also has been done away by the 15th Finance Commission. So on account of the fact that the 15th Finance Commission has done away with the criteria of income distance as well as the share of SC and ST population, the local bodies in the poorer states may not get adequate amount of finances. This is a concern which has been raised in this particular article. Secondly, the 15th Finance Commission has laid down that if the local bodies have to avail the grants from the center, then they would have to fulfill these two conditionalities. But the article has highlighted that in spite of these conditionalities which have been repeatedly imposed by the earlier Finance Commission, the local bodies in case of India have failed to upgrade their financial reporting system because of which some of the local bodies may actually miss out on getting these grants from the center. So these are some of the important aspects which one should know with respect to this particular article. Now based upon our video discussion, you can try attempting these three prelim space questions for the practice. You can give your answers in the comment section given below. With this, let us now take up the next article. Now this particular article appears on page number one. The article is titled as Government Sharply Cuts the Interest Rates on the Small Savings Instruments. This article shall be important mainly with respect to prelims under the subsection of Indian Economy. This article basically highlights that the government of India has decided to reduce the rate of interest on various small savings schemes by almost around 40 to 110 basis points. In this regard, let us understand various facets related to the small savings schemes in India. See the households in case of India have basically two avenues for saving the money. 
either they can save the money in the bank account or they can save the money in various small saving schemes which are run by the government of India. Presently, we have almost around 12 small saving schemes. These small saving schemes are broadly categorized into three types. Postal deposits, which include both savings deposits as well as the fixed deposits. Then the saving schemes such as the National Savings Certificate, Kisan Vikas Patra, then the social security schemes such as the Public Provident Fund, Senior Citizen Saving Scheme and Sukanya Samriddhi Scheme. The government of India, as you can see here, has decided to reduce the rate of interest on these 12 small savings schemes. Now, whatever money the government earns through these small savings schemes, all that money goes into a separate and dedicated fund known as the National Small Savings Fund which is maintained under Public Account of India. So please do understand here that the National Small Savings Fund is not maintained as part of Consolidated Fund of India, rather it is maintained as part of Public Account of India. Now certain amount of money which is lying under NSSF is in turn invested in special government securities. So, in a way, the government is borrowing certain amount of money from the National Small Savings Fund in order to finance its deficit. See, usually the government borrows the money from the market and this market borrowings of the government is either in the form of the treasury bills or the dated securities. The government issues the treasury bills to borrow money for the short term purposes and the government issues the dated securities in order for long term borrowings. Now the market borrowings of the government of India is the largest source of government's borrowings. After the market borrowings, the second major source of government's borrowings happens to be the money that the government borrows from the National Small Savings Fund. It is usually denoted as securities issued against the National Small Savings Fund in the annual financial statement which is presented as part of the budget. Apart from that, a certain amount of money from the National Small Savings Fund is also used by the government to give certain amount of loans to the PSUs such as the Food Corporation of India for the payment of subsidy. Now, this we call it as the off-budget financing. Now, why is it called as off-budget financing? Now, imagine, let's say the government of India has to pay rupees 100 in the form of food subsidy to the Food Corporation of India. And let's say the government is paying this rupees 100 directly from Consolidated Fund of India. Moreover, in order to pay this food subsidy of rupees 100, the government could have borrowed this money from the market. Now, either government is paying this particular money directly from the Consolidated Fund of India, especially by borrowing the money, automatically this will lead to increase in the fiscal deficit. And moreover, this would get reflected in the government's accounts, that is in the Consolidated Fund of India. So, in order to reduce the fiscal deficit, the government goes for the off-budget financing. So as part of the off-budget financing here, the government would ask the Food Corporation of India to borrow this rupees 100 from the National Small Savings Fund. So if the FCI is borrowing this rupees 100 from the National Small Savings Fund, this will not be reflected in the government's budget. Moreover, this will not be reflected in the government's fiscal deficit. So the off-budget financing is basically a tool which is used by the government of India in order to keep its fiscal deficit lower. Now various aspects of off-budget financing, I have already discussed this as part of the economic survey video. So you can go through the economic survey video to understand about the off-budget financing. See one important development which has taken place in this year's budget is that the finance minister has explicitly stated that the practice of the FCI borrowing loans from the National Small Savings Fund for the payment of food subsidy would be stopped henceforth. That is, from the present year, FCI would no longer borrow money from 
the national small savings fund whatever food subsidy the government has to pay the government would pay this food subsidy directly from the consolidated fund of india so this is a recent development which has taken place in this year's budget accordingly this particular concept of national small savings fund would become extremely important for your upcoming prelims examination this particular article basically highlights that the government of india has decided to reduce the rate of interest on the various small savings schemes by almost around 40 to 110 basis points as you can see in this particular chart so what are the reasons for the decrease in the interest rates see the interest rates on these small savings schemes is fixed by the government of india on a quarterly basis and the interest rates on these small savings schemes in turn depends upon the yields on the government securities of a similar maturity period for example if you want to know as to what should be the rate of interest on a five years time deposit this will be approximately almost near to the yields on the government security of five year maturity period similarly if you want to know as to what should be the rate of interest on a two years time deposit it will be almost closer to the yields on the government security of a two year maturity period now what has happened in case of india here is in comparison to the previous year the yields on the government securities have got reduced for example the yield on 10 year government security has got reduced from 6.8 percentage in april 2020 to presently around 6.1 percent so broadly there has been decrease in the yields on various government securities and since the yield rates have got reduced accordingly the government has decided to reduce the rate of interest on these various small savings schemes and the second and the most important reason for the decrease in the interest rate here is the government of india is said to borrow huge amount of money through the small savings schemes for example in the financial year 2020 21 the government has borrowed almost around 4.8 lakh crores from the national small savings fund and in the financial year 21 22 the government is said to borrow around 3.9 lakh crores from the small savings schemes so if the government of india is said to borrow more amount of money from the small saving schemes then obviously it would be good if the rate of interest on the small saving schemes is lower if the rate of interest on the small saving schemes is lower then automatically the government's borrowing cost would also reduce so this is one of the most important reason as to why the government has decided to reduce the rate of interest on the small savings schemes now as far as the implication of the rate cut is concerned First and foremost, as discussed, the government's borrowing cost would reduce and hence the government's interest burden would also reduce. Secondly, see presently in case of India, the banks have also been reducing the rate of interest on the bank's deposits. So, so far for the households, a major source for them to save money were the small savings schemes. But since now the government has reduced the rate of interest even on the small savings schemes, now the households would have less amount of avenue to save money so now the rate of interest in the bank's deposit is also lower the rate of interest in the small savings is also lower so the government expects that since the households have less avenues for saving the money this will in turn boost the consumption expenditure in the indian economy and hence revive the economic growth and development now considering the fact that your prelims are fast approaching let us take up two practice questions related to this particular topic of the National Small Savings Fund. The first practice question is, which among the following is or are considered to be part of public debt of the center? The options given here are treasury bills and dated securities, bank recapitalization bonds and sovereign gold bonds, national small savings funds and loans from the multilateral institutions. See, if you want to understand about the total liabilities of the government of India, the total liabilities of the government of India, in terms of accounting, they are categorized into two types. One is the public debt and the second one is the liabilities against the public account of India. So, these two together 
constitute the total liabilities of the government of India. The public debt in turn is categorized into two types that is the internal debt and the external debt depending upon where the government is borrowing the money. Now the treasury bills and dated securities, bank recapitalization bonds and sovereign gold bonds, loans from multilateral institutions, all of these three components are actually accounted under public debt of the center. As far as the national small savings fund is concerned, it is actually accounted under liabilities against the public account of India. It is not directly accounted under the public debt of the center. Accordingly, the right answer to this particular question would be 1, 2 and 4 only that is C. The second practice question is which among the following accounts for the highest share of internal debt of the center. I have already discussed the answer to this particular question separately in the economic survey video discussion. So please try to find out the answer to this particular question and respond in the comments section. Now the next article appears on page number 8 and is titled as a step that enhances the cooperative federalism. This article shall be important mainly with respect to Indian polity and governance. This article has appeared in the newspaper in the context of the recent passage of the Government of National Capital Territory Amendment Act by the Indian Parliament. According to the Indian government, this particular act has been passed by the Indian Parliament in order to streamline the nature of relationship between the elected government in Delhi and the Lieutenant Governor. This particular amendment seeks to clear the ambiguity in the roles and responsibilities of the elected government and the left hand governor in Delhi. So this particular amendment has introduced a number of features. First and foremost it has highlighted that the term government which is referred to any law made by the legislative assembly of Delhi it would mean left hand governor and not the democratically elected government of Delhi. Secondly it has also laid down that in some of the cases when the Delhi Legislative Assembly passes a bill, some of the bills have to be reserved by the Lieutenant Governor for the assent by the President. Thirdly, it has also laid down that the elected government in Delhi, that is the Chief Minister aided by the Council of Ministers, the elected government of Delhi has to take the prior opinion of the Lieutenant Governor before taking certain executive actions on certain important matters. Now, as to on what important matters should the Chief Minister take the prior opinion of the left hand governor is concerned, this has not been elaborated in the amendment. It is up to the left hand governor to decide as to on which matters the elected government should take the prior opinion from the left hand governor. According to the government, the government believes that this particular amendment will streamline the nature of relationship between the democratically elected government of Delhi and the left hand governor and it will bring about good governance in the national capital territory. On the other hand, the opposition parties have been highlighting that the passage of this particular amendment would go against the interest of the democratically elected government of Delhi. In a way, this will strengthen the role of the central government in the administration of the national capital territory. Now all of these aspects related to this particular amendment have already been discussed in our DNS dated 20th of March 2021 because of which we will not be going into these aspects once again. But what we will do here is we will take up a prelims question for the practice. The question here is consider the following statements with respect to the national capital territory of Delhi. The first statement here is the government of Union Territories Act specifically provides for the steps to be taken in the failure of constitutional machinery in the national capital territory of Delhi. See, the 69th constitutional amendment introduced two articles to the Indian constitution. One is article 239AA and second one is article 239AB. Article 239AA provides for the legislative assembly for the National Capital Territory of Delhi along with the Chief Ministers and the Council of Ministers. It also provides that the Council of Ministers headed by Chief Minister would aid and advise the Lieutenant Governor in exercise of his functions. 
So basically, Article 239AA provides for a framework for the working mechanism of the elected government in Delhi. But at the same time, Article 239AB provides that President, based upon a report submitted by the Lieutenant Governor or otherwise also, if he feels that there is a breakdown of the constitutional machinery in the National Capital Territory of Delhi, then he can suspend the operation of Article 239AA. So this particular provision of suspension of Article 239AA is not provided under the Government of Union Territories Act. Rather, it is provided under the Indian Constitution itself. That is why this statement here is wrong. The next two statements which are given here are correct. Accordingly, the right answer to this particular question would be 2 and 3 only. The next article appears on page number 10 and is titled as Panel Submits a Report on the Form Loss to the Supreme Court. I hope all of you must be aware recently Parliament of India passed the three farm acts in order to give the necessary freedom to the farmers to sell their agricultural produce and liberalize the agricultural marketing regime. But the passage of these three farm acts has proved to be controversial and has been opposed by a large number of farmer groups. Accordingly, based upon a PIL filed before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of India had appointed a four-member committee to look into these three farm acts. Now, this particular article highlights that this committee appointed by the Supreme Court has recently submitted its report. However, this particular report has been submitted in a closed cover and it has not been made public so far. Accordingly, as far as your UPSC prelims and mains examination is concerned, one should be aware about the various pros and cons of the three farm acts. All of these aspects have already been covered by us in a separate video which has been released on the YouTube. In this particular video, we have carried out the critical analysis of the three farm acts. Hence, since these aspects have already been covered, what we will do here is, we will take up a practice question. The question here is, with reference to the Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce Promotion and Facilitation Act 2020, consider the following statements. The first statement here is, under this act, the farmers have been given the freedom to sell their agricultural produce from, from the farm gates, factory premises, warehouses and APMCs without any payment of market fee. I hope you must be aware this particular act basically seeks to promote intrastate and interstate trading of agricultural commodities. Under this particular act, farmers have been given the complete freedom to sell their agricultural produce within the trade area without any payment of market fee. This act defines as to what exactly is a trade area. Now trade area under this particular act can include the farm gate, it can include the factory premises, it can include the warehouses, it can include the cold chain infrastructure and so on. So from these trade areas, the farmers can sell their agriculture produce without any payment of market fee. However, please do understand that under this particular act, the trade area does not include the APMCs. So the APMCs which have been set up by the respective state government do not come under the ambit of trade area under this particular act. What this means is if the farmers are selling their agricultural produce in the APMCs and if the state governments impose a market fee, then the farmers would have to compulsorily pay the market fee. The second statement here is all the traders must compulsorily obtain the trading licenses from the center to buy the agricultural commodities from the farmers. Now presently under the APMC regime, the traders are required to obtain the trading licenses from the respective state government in order to buy the agricultural commodities from the farmers. But under this particular act, it has been laid down that the traders are not required to obtain the trading licenses. The traders must have only the permanent account number, that is a PAN card. So having a PAN card alone 
would make them eligible to buy the agricultural commodities from the farmers. So the second statement which is given here is also wrong. Accordingly, the right answer to this particular question would be D. That is neither 1 nor 2. The next article appears on page number 14. The article is titled as India's GDP to grow at 7.5 to 12.5 percentage in the financial year 21-22, says World Bank. This article shall be important mainly with respect to prelims under the subsection of Indian economy. Recently, World Bank has published its report titled as South Asia Economic Focus Report. According to this particular report, the Indian economy is expected to grow at 10.1 percentage in the financial year 21-22. Now, this positive outlook about the growth of the Indian economy is on account of multiple factors. First and foremost, the government of India has adopted the counter cyclical fiscal policy in order to revive the Indian economy. Secondly, the pent up demand in the Indian economy is expected to increase the overall consumption expenditure. And thirdly, the rollout of the COVID 19 vaccine has also contributed to a positive outlook about the growth prospects. See, as far as the UPSC prelims examination is concerned, one should be aware about the various reports published by the international agencies. See, recently, we have made available the Economic Prelims Compass 2021 for our Rouse IS students. This prelims compass for the Indian economy will also be made available to all other students in your nearby stores as well as on the Amazon website. This prelims compass 2021 has incorporated all the core as well as the current developments which have taken place in the Indian economy in the last one and a half to two years. So as you can see, this is a snapshot of the prelims compass 2021, particularly with respect to the World Bank Group, wherein we have covered all the prelims related aspects with respect to the World Bank Group, wherein we have discussed about the World Bank Group the structure of the World Bank, such as the various international institutions under the World Bank and international institutions under the World Bank Group, the structure of the World Bank, and then the various reports published by the World Bank, such as the Doing Business Report, Human Capital Index Report, World Development Report, Global Economic Prospects, Logistic Performance Index, Business and Law, Global Financial Development Report, and so on. Now, based upon this, let us take up a practice question with respect to this particular article. The question here is, which of the following reports are published by the World Bank? First one is Logistic Performance Index, which is correct. Now, similar to the Logistic Performance Index published by the World Bank, we do have the Trade Facilitation Index, which is published by OECD. Then we have Enabling Trade Index, which is published by the World Economic Forum. Next option is Human Capital Index, which is also correct. Next one is Human Development Report. Now, the Human Development Report is published by UNDP and not by the World Bank. Next is Global Wage Report. Global Wage Report is published by the International Labour Organization. So, if you look at the options which are given here, the right answer to this particular question would be B, 1 and 2 only. Now, all the important international reports which could probably be asked in your prelims examination have been incorporated in the prelims compass magazine and it would soon be available to you in the nearby stores as well as on the Amazon platform. With this, we have come to end of today's discussion. Now, the question that was asked in yesterday's DNS was, consider the following statements related to the Heart of Asia conference. The answer to that particular question was option D, that is neither one nor two. The question for today's DNS is the following accounts for the highest share of internal debt of the government. 